Hello, for first updates now, I'm Tyler Rolds, and you're watching Behind the Bumpers. It's fun show where we dive deeper into FRC robots and what makes them work. And today I'm here with Team Number 1325 Inverse Paradox from Ontario. 1325 dates back to 2004, but has really been on a tear since the 2015 season with six event wins, including most recently in the 2020 season, winning the Georgian College event. Uh, they won the Ontario Provincial Championship in 2018. They had a championship division win back in 2015. They also have eight finalist awards, including a provincial championship division finalist in 2019, five chairman's awards, and a whole plethora of others really making this a complete team. And today, from team number 1325, I have Francis and Emil. And we're going to be jumping into this robot, really what makes it work, the ethos of it, some iterations that have gone through. Can't wait to hear more about this really cool team and robot. All this and more coming up on Behind the Bumpers. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now is supported by Kettering University. On average, Kettering students earn $45,000 to $70,000 over the course of their co-op program to help them graduate debt-free. 99% of students qualify for a merit scholarship, and you can apply for one of the 80-plus first scholarships worth up to $25,000 each. Schedule your virtual visit to get started at kettering.edu. Get ready for esports for those in first with the Fun Gaming League. FGL will have tournament events and be setting up clan play soon. FGL is open to all students, mentors, alumni, and volunteers in first ages 13 and older. Join the Fun Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now for tournament and event info. So I'm going to start, start us out on this intake here. I'd love to hear about uh, some of the iterations that you, your team has gone through uh, throughout the Infinite Recharge season. Uh, talk to me about the concept, the design, and then what's been changed throughout the years as well. Yep. So I wanted to first talk about sort of some iterations that we went through. Um, so if you take a look at our intake, um, our first intake used to be uh, sort of one roller with mechanisms um, and two omni wheels in the center. And the idea behind that intake was to vector the balls uh, along the bumper and then put it up into our indexer. Um, at the Georgian College event, we figured out that we would actually drive over balls and they wouldn't vector fast enough. Um, so then after that, uh, we rebuilt our intake and we sort of went with uh, two roller design um, and did sort of the funneling inside of our robot instead of outside. So when, um, when you're looking at the mechanical, you know, aspect of this, can you talk to me about, uh, you know, I can, I can see some of the compliant wheels. What is the material that's around that upper part of your roller that you have? Um, so do you mean like over here? Uh, no, the, sorry, the one right in front. Yeah, what is that? Um, so this is just uh, an aluminum tube. Uh, that's sort of there for structure. Um, and these are our two rollers. Uh, so it just sort of keeps these polycarb uh, plates um, sort of centered and not... Too compliant. Um, how about from like a programming and sensor standpoint, uh, Francis, what's gone into it from that route? Perfect. So we want everything to be smooth and flow well in a game. So we have a PID control loop. Uh, it goes down, goes up, knows where its position is. Uh, we were thinking of adding, all right, we were thinking of adding a automatic ball pickup detection, but we figured that it would just be easier for us to implement a manual one where drivers can do it themselves. Uh, other than that, programming is pretty straightforward. It interacts with the entire robot system really well, so it knows when to intake, when not to intake. And there's a ball limit, so we know when there's five balls in, so we can't intake anymore, and that sort of thing. So one thing I want to ask you as, as that kind of intake, then we saw that power cell pop up a little bit, right? Um, what does your team try to do to try to mitigate like power cells from popping out or jamming or anything like that? Um, yeah, so what we've done for that is we've sort of uh, made this hopper a little more compliant. Um, so what that allows the robot to sort of do is sort of self-center the balls. And we also noticed that uh, the field had a lot of bumps this year, um, especially going over that berm. Um, if balls were stuck here, by the time we would cross the field, uh, that all would get sorted out because we would just drive over the berm and everything would sort of shake into place um, because we made the hopper uh, compliant enough to be able to do that. Yeah, I love that. That's that's awesome. So uh, looking at kind of that next part where we're going into uh, the, the power cell coming into your tower sort of thing, talk to me a little bit more some of the design there. Yeah, so uh, our indexer is belt driven. And basically we have, so this uh, part of the indexer is actually uh, angled about like three degrees. Um, and that sort of helps us uh, sort of angle the balls inwards and get them flowing inside. Um, and that sort of eliminated the need 
for a uh, top to the indexer, because as you saw, the balls would sort of pop up. Um, so if we had a top, there would be chances where uh, it would pop up too high. Um, so having the gravity uh, feeding sort of helped with that. Um, and then if you go sort of uh, to the 90 degree bend, uh, there's green compliant wheels. Um, and then again, it's belt driven and uh, the balls just sort of drive up. And then we also use sensors, uh, beam brakes over here, um, so that the robot knows um, sort of where balls are. Um, and Francis can talk about uh, the programming behind that. But yeah, so we have a series of beam brakes within the robot. We had to work with our limitations. We were able to create a system where we can only have five balls at a time and a system where we have a ball primed at the top here. So when the top beam brake is broken, the flywheel spins at a set RPM. And I'm not sure if I could show that right now because it's disabled, uh, but it does help us shoot a lot faster when we pick up a ball on our side or the enemy's side. And it saves us that rev up time that can be super important in cycles. So the moment uh, power cell number one essentially hits that beam break up top, that's when that's being activated, right? So you're still yep. kind of in process of uh, intaking and collecting while that shooter is uh, revving up? Of course, yeah. So it stays there, and then it gives us the rev up speed. It isn't going to be a high or low speed since we do have a heavy wheel. Sure. We wanted to have it below the minimum in order to reach any speed that we wanted, but faster than we would at a dead stop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I want to ask you about um, the... Uh, bend where the power cell hits that 90 degree bend on there uh, inside your tower. So how did you, when, you, when you're looking at it from a design perspective, like how did you figure out like, you know, this is the compression that we want. This is how we're going to, you know, bend it this way so the power cells don't jam up against each other. Now, I know you have the beam brakes that definitely help out with that too, but from a mechanical side, how did you uh, factor that in? Yeah, so um, one thing that we really found with our prototype was um, sort of tuning the how tight our belts are. Um, and that sort of helped with the compliance to get around uh, with the get around the bend. Um, so to sort of tune the compliance uh, of the belts, we have this belt tensioner here. Um, and basically what it is is ball bearings on a slot uh, that can push inwards to make the belt more tighter, and it can push outwards to make the ball less tight. Um, and that really helped um, with sort of fine tuning uh, how we want the power salt to come around the corner. Um, and then we also had like our prototype. So we did a lot of iterations with the back plate. I'm not sure if you can see it through there, but there's a back plate over here. Um, and with our prototype, we went through a lot of iterations of the shape of it. Uh, we tried a flat piece, we tried curve things. Um, and at the end, we realized that a flat piece uh, was the best option and it gave us the best compression around the corner. Let's move next into your uh, shooter. I'd love to hear more about uh, what's gone into it. I know you've got some other uh, parts of the shooter to show off as well. So uh, start us out with uh, uh, how the concept was and any changes that might have been made as well. Yeah, so um, our shooter is a uh, turreted shooter, um, and we use a limelight to aim. It's a, it has a two-position hood that's pneumatically actuated, um, and we're, it's powered by two Neos on a two-to-one belt ratio. Um, and then if you come over here, uh, we can sort of show off the parts a little more. Um, so this is our flywheel. Um, it actually weighs about three pounds. Um, it's fully machined aluminum. Um, we realized that with the polyurethane wheels, it was actually expanding a lot at high RPMs. Um, so in order to counteract that, we machined a fully aluminum wheel and this wouldn't expand. Um, and over here we have our turret ring gear. Um, so this was also custom machined by one of our sponsors. Uh, it was laser cut, um, and it's sort of like a ring gear uh, for our turret, uh, so we can drive the turret and power it. And Prince, if you want to hold the mic, sure. hold the mic. Um, so basically, this is uh, our turret. Um, there's a plastic bushing uh, that's sort of uh, bolted down to the turret assembly, and the shooter is bolted down to this quarter plate. Um, and then what that allows us to do is uh, sort of spin um, and because this is an HTP block there's really low friction uh, so we were able to make a really simple turret uh, using just a plastic block and a metal plate. Yeah so there's not like any lubricant in that or anything right it's just rubbing right against it? Uh, yeah um, at one point we did have Teflon tape on it uh, just to sort of help with the friction a little bit but otherwise it's just 
it's just the Teflon tape and the aluminum. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, talk to us from a uh, programming side, uh, Francis, like uh, what's gone into uh, getting different angles for your shooter. Obviously, we see a limelight on your robot, but uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the specifics on how it's actually being utilized. Perfect. So with our shooter, we also have it run off a PID loop again. And with shooters, you need to have a constant speed and shooting at the same distance or the same speed in order to hit the same point. We use a limelight and a couple tricks and tricks to determine our distance and our angle to the targets. And with that, we have our two set hood. With the lower angle, we have one speed map, and that's for anything close to the target since we do shoot higher. And then with the second speed map, which is going to be with the hood up, that's going to shoot further and at a steeper angle, close to 45, I believe. Also with this, we have two NEOs running on it. Tuning it was a little tough because the RevSpark Max software is fairly new. I do want to ask you about the aluminum flywheel in particular. Um, so, you know, a lot of teams have created, you know, something where they have a different wheel or different material contacting. Uh, how did you figure out to say like, hey, uh, having straight up aluminum contacting the power cells is the way we want to go? Because obviously it's been working well for your team. Yeah, so um, we actually noticed that with um, the balls were really sticky this year. So when we, when we were using that rubber wheel, we noticed that uh, our release was very slow because we had a really sticky wheel and we had really sticky balls. Um, so when we first machined the aluminum wheel, we actually put gaffer's tape on top of it. Um, and we realized that that wasn't something we want to do because we want a slippery wheel so we can have uh, faster release on the balls. Um, because, as you know, the balls are so grippy this year. I love hearing about uh, how you determined uh, that process went into it. That's something that uh, I don't, I can't recall if I've seen other teams do that or not, but really awesome to see that's working well for your team. Uh, let's move on and talk about your uh, climbing mechanism, what's gone into it, uh, and how it's been working out for you. Yeah, so um, our climber is basically a one stage elevator, um, and it has these custom machined uh, aluminum hooks at the top. Um, and if you want to come over here, to the side. Uh, that's our gearbox powering the climber. And there's a pneumatically, act I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but there's a pneumatically actuated winch and pull brake um, in the gearbox right here. And that helps us stay up uh, at the end of the match. And so the climber itself has a 400 pound stall load. Um, and we did that on purpose uh, to make sure that we're never affected by stall during a match. Um, and our goal with the climber was to make it as fast as possible. Um, so the climber proved to be really fast because once at Georgian, uh, there was about seven seconds left when we were lining up to climb and entering uh, sort of the, the seal generator zone. Um, and then we ended the match up, uh, up off the ground. So that proved that our climber was uh, sort of meeting its goal of being fast. Um, and then we also, uh, just to make sure uh, that we don't fall down at the end of the match, we sort of plumbed our piston to make sure that it's always extended uh, when there's no power to the robot. Um, and that's to sort of make sure that if, in the case that we're in the middle of climbing and the match ends, uh, the climber will still stop moving um, and we wouldn't have to sort of deploy our brake and just go straight in. Francis can talk about the programming. With yeah, Palmer. that'd be great. I'd love to hear about that. And then Francis as well, too. Uh, anything that you might want to add in regards to like your autonomous or anything like that, too, that we haven't discussed yet? Of course. Uh, with the elevator, we do have set points for different heights. So we measured how high the bar could possibly go. We have a high, a middle, and a low. Uh, we figured that it could be anywhere, really, and it's not the best to just guess. So we put it in the middle, and we let the drivers determine whether they need to go higher or a little bit lower. With that, we also just had a PID tuned as well, make sure it's smooth. We have the elevator on a lock as well, so it can't move if it's not 30 seconds into the match, or 30 seconds till the end of the match, in order to keep us inside of the frame perimeter. That I feel like has probably saved us a couple times. And from an autonomous perspective, we basically, it's pretty straightforward map points, we drive to them. We didn't have enough time to develop a really outstanding one for Georgian as we usually do because this year was short, COVID, so on and so forth. So, but we've improved, and especially with the 2021 Infinite Recharge 2 season, when we had those autonomous challenges, we were able to upgrade our code and make it all work with this robot. 
And what's special with that is that we didn't build a new robot. We didn't really have the time or the opportunities to make one. So we made an autonomous code, brand new from scratch, or improved it at least, and made it work. We competed extremely well and got plenty of points considering the fact that we don't have Swerve. It's an old robot and we were running on concrete. Yeah, so now we can sort of just show off uh, our auto vision tracking. Um, so you can see as we rotate the robot, uh, our turret also rotates, allowing us to do drive-bys. Um, and that proved very effective in matches because um, if you're sort of shooting uh, with defense on you, being able to move and shoot at the same time uh, can really sort of counteract defense. Um, and if we move at an even greater speed, you can see that the turret uh, keeps up with the robot. And we have 270 degrees of motion, um, so we can pretty much hold any angle that we need to uh, to the target. What's also great is that we also accounted for forward momentum. So if you are driving in a straight line, you can shoot as well. And if you even have a curved line, actually, you can probably shoot into the center hole. Um, so as you can see, the rate of fire of the robot was really fast. Uh, because of ball degrade, uh, the balls degrading, uh, the accuracy was not uh, really there where it used to be. Um, and I think we all remember from 2016 how the ball started acting after a year. Um, so the infinite recharge balls sort of did the same thing. Well, Inverse Paradox, I'll definitely agree that your team has been performing awesome. And, you know, looking at just the last few years, your team seems to be getting better and better. Uh, so I can't wait to see with Rapid React coming up how your team's going to be performing there. So we really appreciate you taking the time to tell us more about uh, your Infinite Recharge robot. And we can't wait to see what your team's going to be bringing for uh, Rapid React. Good luck uh, next season. We can't wait to hear more about your team. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks to Kettering University for their support of this video. Kettering University is a national leader in experiential STEM and business education. Discover why so many FIRST alumni come to Kettering University by scheduling a virtual visit at Kettering.edu. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.